Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Anne Haish. Now, I know I've had a ton of requests after her death a few months back to channel her, and I originally intended to do just that. However, every time I tapped into the energetic field, it felt so disjointed and so really deep energetic of what I could only describe as being distraught or depression, really just heavy, like, like she felt angry and sad and hard to connect to. And I wanted to give her some time to adapt and adjust to have the archangels help her with a life review. So this is an opportunity in this particular channeling with Anne Heche to talk to you about life review and how our spirit guides do support us. And sometimes it's archangels like Archangel Michael or Gabriel. Um, sometimes it's Ural. Um, lots of different archangels will come in to assist us or maybe Mother Mary or um, whoever that is for you um, to be able to help us understand looking over the course of our life and the choices that we've made and the opportunities we had, the goods, the bads, the whole mix of, of all of it that creates the whole of what our life has been. And it's nothing to be afraid of. Life review can actually happen when you're in your darkest hour. It can be the very thing that saves your ass, okay? It can be that moment when you're at rock bottom and you look up and you say, okay, what do I want? The archangel says to you, what do you want? And you say, I wanna live. And then you make that choice and you live. And you're reminded of that choice over and over and over again. And so too, life review can happen at major massive transition points in your lifetime. And for her, it felt like she really needed time to kind of sort and sift and have multiple sessions for that. It doesn't mean she was a bad person at all. It doesn't mean she was messed up or anything like that. It means that she loved hard in her lifetime and her emotions and her heart really needed and deserved time to be able to be held in a private, really um, sacred container. And so I, I stayed away from that for a while. And so now it's a good, it feels like the right time. And it's interesting because even though I'm going to be sharing this particular video on a, a Halloween or Samhain, um, it doesn't really fit that necessarily, a theme or anything, but it just seems like the right time. I'm recording this actually on Sunday, the 30th of October, 2022. I'm not sure if that date is significant to her or not, but I'm sharing all this with you so you understand because at Above Life Channel, it is an opportunity to, to educate you, to give you some information and understanding about death. And so too, then the reflection of life and what life means, that's the point. It's your life, so live it. Yeah, that's the point, okay? And at, at times it's really hard for us to do that, isn't it? Damn right it is. All right, so here we go. I am also going to burn some balsam fir incense that I have to kind of connect, to keep the air clear and purified. And I think almost like a therapy session kind of a thing or like a healing room. It's like I'm at a treatment center, an, an inpatient treatment center, and I'm being called in um, to have a session with her where she's preparing then to kind of come back out into the world. What I could have presume if you're in like a 30 or 60 day treatment kind of facility. And it's not because of her physical body connection to addiction or her mind connection to mental health. It's not that it's about her heart space. So we're going to honor her heart space. We're going to make this nice and pure. She doesn't feel pure. In her lifetime, she didn't feel, she felt like her innocence was taken. There's definitely um, abuse. Um, it looks like child sexual abuse. I'm just going to say it like it is because let's just be honest, we're all adults here and we have experienced a lot of different things in our life and it's time to not be ashamed of what has happened to you or what you have experienced. It's time to be honest about that and know that it's not, that wasn't your doing. So let's use this to clear the space. Hi, Anne, come on in, it's nice to see you. Hi, have a seat. Lots of pink, yes, thank you. 
there is a pink light and aura around her and it, there's a soft, fuzzy little, fluffy little pink blanket right there for you, light pink. Yeah, to, to honor your heart, my dear, because I can feel your heart space. And so when we have our conversation today, I, I just want you to understand and know that I am welcoming you here and honoring your heart space. And what you are sharing with us today is going to help heal so many hearts, okay? And she's crying a little bit, only on one side. Interesting, the right side is crying, the right tears coming from the right eye, which is divine masculine. Yes. She says, you're right. She says, you are, um, you're right about the child trauma, the child sexual trauma. Yeah. She said, yes, you're right. And you're absolutely right. She says, no one should hurt children. No one should hurt anybody for that matter, but no one should hurt children. Okay. All right. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Okay, so before I came into the office to actually do this session, you, I heard something very specific that you wanted to say. You want to have a voice that is clear, um, separate and clear from anger. And you don't want to come across as blaming anyone. So I want to say that because she said that right before we talked, I got that message very specifically. Okay. All right, so it's pure. You are welcome to say whatever needs to be said. She says, I just want to feel love. Archangel Hanel is with her, H-A-N-I-E-L, Hanel. Very soft, loving, nurturing. She's nurturing, being nurtured back to her full self. She says, part of the reason, she says, part of why you struggle to feel me is because of the strong disconnect from my body. And in order to be able to fully be free, she says, and to really know and be unconditional love and to reunite with the light, I need to be able to stop blaming my body. Oh, oh honey. Oh, stop blaming your body. Did you hear that? You who are listening? In order to be able to fully be unconditional love for yourself, to be that before you can even be in relationship with anybody else, you need to stop blaming your body. She did not betray you. Your body did not betray you. She tried to save your ass. Hmm. She says, thank you. She says, so misunderstood, so many of us. She said, so many of us are so misunderstood, so misunderstood, she says. I don't like, she says, I, I very, she very specifically does not want to use the word victim, but to be super honest with you guys, that's the most closely related word vibrationally. And I know that word will trigger. She does not want to feel like a victim. She doesn't want to call herself a victim, but she knows when something happens to you beyond your control that causes you great trauma and suffering that that indeed is you are a victim. Right. And you don't have to be ashamed of that. She says, we don't have to be ashamed in that moment that that's exactly what we were. We were victim. And she says, as an adult woman, okay, so tell us, can you tell, okay, as an adult, she's going right to the adulthood. Yeah. Can you tell us, can you tell? Can you tell them what you said to me that you really wanted people to know about you? Because I think that that's profound and that's going to help a lot of people, especially you empaths that are listening to this and feeling this in relationships. Okay. Oh, she says, oh, about the narcissistic part. Yeah. Yes. About that. Anne. she's like, okay, Bridget, let's just tell it like it is. And she pulls her heel up to her, her, uh, body and kind of sits into a like a kind of a half yoga pose kind of a vibe mm -hmm. she says um I don't want people to claim to know me and those who claim to know me those who've been in 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 relationship with me and my family and she says, because they don't know, they really don't know. 
she says. They really don't know. They can't know the pain. They can't understand how it affects me. And, and um, she's like traumatized. She says traumatized. She says, um, okay, just, okay, let's be direct, Anne. Let's be direct. Share with them. If, if you're okay doing that, I really want you to be able to share that with me. Yeah. She says about the narcissistic, yes, okay. She says, I am not, I was not the narcissist. She says, very point blank, I was not the narcissist. And I don't think she's trying to like charm me. I don't feel that at all. And it wouldn't work anyway. Um, but I don't feel that. And she just says, I was not the narcissist. I wasn't. She said, oh, oh, I, oh, I know it looks like I was. I know it looks like it was all me, right? And she says, um, that's what happens. She said, you learn how to react and respond and prepare. And you try different strategies to be able to match or manage the narcissist. And she says, you can't. You can't beat them at their own game because you are not that. You have to truly be cold hearted and detached. And she says, I'm not blaming anyone else. I'm not blaming the people I have been in relationship with. I'm not blaming them for that. She says, because it's likely, she says, it's likely because of their own trauma, they don't even know. They just use that as a mechanism in relation. And she says, I don't, I'm not saying that you can't heal from that or change that, but it's like narcissists are not sociopaths. <laughs> They're not. She says, um, but they literally make you crazy. It literally, it literally makes you feel, she says, she grabs her head and she goes crazy because you think, wait a minute, I said that. Wait, no, I didn't say that. That's not what I meant. And she says, they don't hear you. They don't listen. They listen to hurt you. They listen to, to control you. They listen to your deepest most intimate secrets and knowing you so personally, especially in the beginning, she says, in the honeymoon phase, you just open up and you share everything, the truth, they know all the truths. And later it comes up and they hurt you with it over and over again. And they just like, they tangle this, like it's like a noose around your neck, she says, and it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter until you wish you were dead. It cuts off, she said, it cuts off the ability for your mind and your heart to communicate. The, the narcissist takes away your voice. And then they, when you have a voice and you raise your voice, that is used, the way you react is used against you to manipulate your mind into starting this, oh, you're not enough, you're not good enough, maybe they're right, nobody's gonna want me, that kind of a thing, she says. She says, my career was trashed because I couldn't see what was best for me. Are you talking about Hollywood career? Because I feel like you had a business too. That feels right to me too. And it feels really organic or natural or something. I don't know much about her, you guys. I know that she was married to Ellen. I think she was married or she was with Ellen. I know she was with Ellen. I know that. Um, and I also know she's been with men and women and I assume bisexual. That's what I assume. Um, but I don't know her identity. We didn't talk about that yet. Um, so talk about your career. You're, I'm assuming you're talking about Hollywood. Yes. She said, yes. She said, I was, I was an up and coming actress. She said, I was a rising star. She said, some might question that, but it's, it's how it was feeling at the time. I was really on a high end. I really trusted um, when she says, when Ellen came into my life, I really trusted her wisdom. You know, she, she had been, through so much and she was so, she seemed so courage, so brave and so, so um, like she had so much to give, she says. And it was like this cause, I felt like I was championing a cause by being with her, I was championing, championing a cause. Like I was part of something meaningful and, and and good and sorry, I have a dress on and the pockets are driving me nuts. Just a minute. Pockets are good. They're just not practical. Okay. She says, I felt like I was part of a cause, like a movement, you know. She says. 
Um, then I hear the name Liam. I don't know what that means. I don't know what Liam is. And she says, I wanted to do good, you know? And so I, she says, like, I felt like I was in this place, like a wishbone. She literally shows me a why, like a wishbone kind of thing, like literally a wishbone where you pull one side or the other and whoever gets the biggest part wins or gets their wish or whatever. She says like that, like I was at this place, she says, where um, I had to, it's like, it's like, it felt like, and she said, I'm not saying this is the truth. She's saying, I'm telling you what it felt like for me. She said, this is a perspective, okay? And she's like, what it felt like for me is that I had to choose between being successful as an actress and famous, being able to just pick the roles I wanted at some point, right? She says, that's what you want as an actress, be able to just pick the roles, pick and choose, she says. That's that's the goal, ultimate goal. And uh I was at this point where it was between that and between not virtue. What is the standing in? It's like being a leader in this value system, in this um, like social change movement, like the vibration, the momentum of that was coming and it was churning and it was churning and it was churning. And she said, I couldn't help but want to be part of that, of, of, and she says, it's almost like a premonition sort of a thing. She said, it's kind of like being psychic. She said, you see, she said, I felt like I was standing at this place where I could see this as one of my paths being a successful actress and that, or this being part of the social momentum for change and advocacy and activism. And she says, and while maybe externally, it didn't look like that directly, she says, I felt like it was either success and money or love and the fullest embodiment of love and the encouragement of love so that other people could feel that too. But it was really, she said, selfishly, it was really about me. What did I want more? Success and money, fame, or love? And she said, I chose love. So is that a mistake? She said, yes, but not because of what you think. It was never a mistake to choose love outside, out loud, big. That wasn't the choice, she said. I misunderstood. I thought it was to be part of this. You know, I had to be out and public and everybody had to accept me and embrace me. And that's how I would get love is externally and through actions and behaviors. And she said, And she said, that was a lie. It was a manipulation. It was a manipulation, she said. It wasn't accurate. And she says, I know now that it's the love of myself that could have brought me everything, everything. It wasn't a sacrifice. I didn't sacrifice fame and success for love. And it looks like it. And she said, and for years, I felt like that. I've been angry about that because I gave up my career to be with a woman to be with Ellen and to be in love and to have that public awareness of my private life, she said. And I really felt like we would be this power couple and have, have it all, you know, create our own empire, she says. And Ellen had a lot of traits and attributes that I admired, but she also had a lot of pain from her road. And okay, I don't know if she wants to say this or not. I'm going to wait and see. I know. So psychically, I know stuff as she's talking to me about that relationship. And I don't know if she wants to talk about it or not. So let's honor that. Let's see. 
she was abusive. She's going to say her behaviors, her pain. Yes, it was. She said it wasn't a healthy relationship. It was not a healthy relationship. She said for me, it was definitely, I'm getting the sense that I know, I know psychically that the power dynamic was off. You can see that. And she, Anne says, It's like she said, it's like I reverted to being a teenager and, and trying to manipulate in order to get what I needed. You know, she said, and all I wanted was the love. I didn't care about the things or the money or any any of the material things. You know, she said, we struggled. We really struggled. She said, it was hard. It was not easy. And she said, and when I had my bouts of depression and and um I felt like my career was ending and I didn't have choices and people stopped calling. I felt like, what do I do now? And then she says something about writing. She turned to writing. I don't know if she wrote a book or she wrote a play or if she wrote a script or whatever, but she wrote, she showed me writing. Um, and she said, I lost myself in that relationship. And she says, it's not because it was a woman. And like, she wants to be really clear. It's not because she was a woman. She said, I have had partners, regardless of the type of partner I had, man or woman is what she's referring to when she says type of partner she had. She's saying, I would consistently be in a situation where I would be giving up my power to please the other person. And some of those relationships were very, there's very much, and she's going to say, she's going to say narcissistic and she says, but my behaviors, although I look, she said, I look like the one that was crazy. I look like the one that was narcissistic. I look like the one that was. And people can believe that. They can think that because the way that I behave, she said, it is a tr like traumatic. Um, it is the way you survive, she said. And to be in a healthy relationship is completely out of the question because you still behave like you're not, she said, because you have to have your guard up. And to trust someone, no, they can trust me, but I'm not gonna trust them, she says. So I will do what it takes in a new relationship in order to build that trust. And she says, I will use the things that other people used for me so that they would fall in love with me and be all about me. And then when my needs weren't being met, then I would circle back around and fall into some of my old traits. She said, I would withdraw within and I would become distant and I would be, you know, wait for that person to start some behaviors that would be like, they're ready to leave or what have you, she says. And then I would step in and either I would break down, she said, and lose it, totally lose it and start using um, drugs and alcohol to help numb the pain from the past, she said. And the person that I was with, the partner, it's not, she's saying, I'm not blaming them. But I have had narcissistic partners. Yes, I'm not going to say exactly who they were, which ones were and which ones were. I'm not going to say that. She said, I'm not going to say that. That's That doesn't matter. That's just gossip, you guys. That's gossip. Cheers to that. Have some tea. Would you like some tea, honey? Mm. Let's make some tea. Rose tea would be great for you, for your heart chakra. For sure, for your heart chakra. And I think it would be, yeah. She's like, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. And she said, I've been doing yoga. It, it really helps Bridget. She's like, you're right about that. Like I do yoga too, not all the time. She's like right over here in my office by my yoga mat. <laughs> and she's like, yoga, Bridget, yoga. She said, it does help with your body, with healing your body. It really does. She said, that's true. That's, that's very true. Okay. You guys are going to hear my bubbler. So my tea, tea kettle. All right. So it's not uncommon for people who've been in abusive situations or who have been, have experienced um, childhood, especially child, like she's like, especially childhood sexual trauma. She said, when it comes to the body, to our bodies as women, she says, it seems as though lots of orange, she's showing me orange, sacral chakra healing. And that happened to be wearing an orange carnelian pendant right here. So we'll flip my tree and the roots into carnelian passion, desire, drive. She said, there's, a, we have a passion to be connected. She's like, we need to be connected. And when someone violates that, 
or abuses the beauty of our bodies, it is hard to, how do you heal that? She said, it is hard to bounce back from that. You just don't forget that. And she said, especially when it happens over and over and again, she shows me her dad. I see her dad. It's like the original narcissist. I don't know. I don't know personally what her trauma was. I can see it, but I don't want to like, if she hasn't talked about it in her human life, which maybe she has, um, I don't know. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like she's alluded to it, but she's never actually outright said it. And she's like six, six years old. Five, between five and six, age five and six. I'm going to also share that November is meaningful to her. Um, for those of you who know Anne and her uh, past relationships and her, her kid or whatever, does she have one child? I think she has a boy. Feels like it. I don't know. Or is it a them they? Do you have a them they? Oh, I don't know if that's public. Damn it. See, I'm too psychic sometimes. I just had a friend and then I just had a mentor tell me, oh my God, Bridget, you're so psychic. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of my thing. <laughs> it's okay. Let's, don't be scared. I don't know everything. I just know some things and I don't really know how, how they fit <laughs> sometimes. It's okay. Oh, let's do that. Let's talk about sexuality. Let's do that. So do you feel like, okay, this is going to be controversial. I'm going to say something that might trigger some of y'all. So just hold on to your chairs right now. So do you think the childhood sexual trauma has impacted your uh, sexuality? <laughs> she says, the way, I, uh, the way I have used and abused my body. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yes, definitely. She says, I can manipulate my sexuality in order to be able to get what I need and want. And she's like, whether that's drugs or alcohol or love or, or um, attention, what, what have you. She's like, yeah. Just like, yeah. Obviously, there's a value in that for other people. And she's, then she says, the wrong kind of people continue to destroy you. She says, when you misuse that part of who you are, she says, it continues to destroy you. Yeah. Yeah. When you're not respected and you're not honored and you're not respecting and honoring yourself. She said, that's hard to handle. She said, that's a hard truth. Yeah. She's saying that's a hard thing to come to terms with. That's the hardest part. She said, in my soul, like her, like I see yellow in her soul. And she says, tell people I'm okay. Yeah. She said, I'm using my intuition now. I'm more connected to my soul and together my spirit and I are, are, are loving and holding my body so it can heal. And she says, I did the most damage to myself in the years since that. And who I've chosen to be with as lovers and how I've chosen to handle my pain is, is, has hurt me more. Yeah. It's hurt me more. Yeah. So as a person, what, how did you identify? How did you identify? Her pronouns were she, her. And she says, I've been with a variety. I've been with a lot of different people. She says, um, I would probably, she said, I would probably say I was bisexual is what I would say. She said, um, she says, because she can't, she's saying she can't use the term pansexual because that would require her to be connected to her spirit. And she doesn't know that she was. She does say that and shows me that she likes crystals and she liked crystals and things and um, energetic, like healing, clearing kind of stuff. Like she was interested in um, some of the metaphysical stuff, um, astrology and things like that. But she said, I didn't really embody it. Like I, there were times, she said, times in my life when I was so healthy, I could get to a place, she says, where I was really healthy. She's showing me green grass and yoga. Like, um, like it reminds me almost like in San Diego, like um, in La Jolla, like where there's like these cliffs and looking down, 
um, into the ocean and there's all these seals and stuff. And like the grass is kind of hard. It's weird grass. It's like hard, like almost like turf. So weird to me. <laughs> but anyway, and I see her like yoga mat and I see her like doing yoga and being healthy and really caring about herself. And um, then she shows me like star energy, like star seed energy and astrology and rocks and crystals and that kind of thing. Like she shows me that. And then she shows me drinking tea and wanting to meditate and that kind of thing, like a holistic kind of a thing. But she says, but I never could quite keep it. She said, I would find times of health and, and peace. And I'd commit to my, my, um, oh my God, sobriety. She just said sobriety. Did you really just say sobriety? Yes, Bridget. She says, why do you think we're talking? Oh, there's a great book for that. I probably told you guys before, Codependent No More, which just had a new release, a revised version of it by Melody Beatty. So Codependency No More. Codependency No More, I think it is. Yeah, Codependency No More by Melody Beatty check it out. She just launched and I just ordered a new version of it. I have read that book literally three times and I have it on audible. And now I have two paperback versions of it. I have the very original one. And then I had, now I'm going to have the new one. It's like recovery is a thing, you guys, it's a big deal, you know, sobriety. Okay. So what God, she shows me AA, but I don't know. Maybe that's just because of the Melody Beatty book. I shows me. She said multiple substances, Bridget, multiple. She said, was showing me being addicted to pills or pain pills. She must have been in an accident. And then she said something about skiing. And then I feel like she was in an accident or something and then took pain meds too. And then combined with alcohol, it was like this toxic combination for her. She says, nothing can compare to your emotional pain. No physical pain, she said, can compare it to your emotional pain. And she says, when you are violated and someone is is um, abusing your body, she says, you leave. She said, there's just this escape that happens. And she says, you know this because you've seen this in your sessions with people. She said, you know what I'm talking about. There's this huge disassociation. You just, shoo. and she says, so then it becomes challenging to even be in your body when you're having good experiences, whether it be through health and wellness and meditations or yoga or what have you. She said, it's hard to like be in your body and with your body because it doesn't ever feel quite clean or pure. It feels like it always is dirty. Like she said, it's kind of like, um, like foggy glasses or something or foggy windshield. Like you just can't clear the fog because it's not, it's, it's not true. Like it's not yours. It's some big external environmental thing. And it has nothing to do with you actually inside the fog isn't inside of you. It's outside. So like the, the, un, the dirtiness is outside of you. It's not inside of you. And so, but you keep trying to understand in some way so that you can let this go, this pain go. But really what you're doing is reattaching to it over and over and over again and choosing to be absent from your body for the good experiences that you have. And she said, even, oh my God, okay. She's going to talk about sex. All right. She said, even when sex is good, she says, I would just abandon my body. And she said, I started to utilize that as a tool for getting what I want even if it was like a momentary high or quick hit, she said, but it was never enough. You know, it didn't work. Like she said, I would be in my body for a bit. And then I couldn't, she said, I couldn't stay. It just, it wasn't real for me because it wasn't true. She said, I wasn't connecting from a, a safe place. It wasn't even a place of joy. It was just a distraction for me. And she said, I could not ever fully be in my body. She said, it was just a means to, to, not a means to an end, a means to what? To stop the suffering temporarily. Wow, okay. And she said, that doesn't matter if you're with a man or a woman. It's the same thing. Interesting, okay. Were you with other women besides Ellen? Yes, she said yes. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, I had multiple partners. And, 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 and in a in a way that was ethical and in a way that was not ethical. She says both, you know, I had multiple partners. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then I hear, so there's been two names that came up. One was Liam and another one's Jake. I don't know who that is, who those people are. If you know, put them in the comments below. All right. Wow, this is really 
Fascinating, actually. I'm going to bring in, um, I feel the energetic vibe of Archangel Raphael just outside the door. And Arch Archangel Raphael is a doctor angel, so helps with meta mental, physical, emotional, um, well-being, wellness. And so I feel like Raphael is coming in to, to wrap her in light and to take her out to do more um, continued embodiment work from the afterlife perspective, which is fascinating. To I am really curious about how do you do embodiment from an afterlife perspective because that was what came up in her life review that she really needed and wanted to have in this lifetime and didn't be able to achieve that. And so now in the afterlife, she's attempting to work through some of that. And it looks like cosmically, energetically with grid systems and all of that sacred geometry to understand what that really meant to her and how really deeply important that was to her and how nothing that happened to her in her physical body actually changed her purity of her physical body. That was a mental judgment about the body based upon the experience that was had or the experiences because they're sequential ones. She's showing me multiple ones. So it was a long-term scenario. Um, so, yeah. Hey, thank you for being courageous and brave for being here today. Lots of yellow energy around her, which is solar plexus and intuitive. And I think we've done some healing for people today. Thanks for being brave and courageous and sharing it like it is. And oh my God, I shared it exactly like it was with Anne Heche from the afterlife. So this is Bridget. I hope I have um, assisted you on your healing journey today because that's exactly what this, this whole channeling feels like. So the timing was divine. I hope that it encourages you to live your life wherever you're at on your healing journey. This is your life after all. You get the opportunity to live it. So please just live it.